first little update. Uh, we were looking a little, a little tight there on getting the car by Friday, on uh, the end, um, third, but thanks to some timely intervention by a few very generous individuals, and I'm um, emphasize few and generous, frankly. But, mm, come on, guys, a few more can join in here and really help us out here. But thanks to them, we are back on track here, and we should be able to get the car on schedule on the third. <sighs> Provided no other big hicks happen in the meantime. And it's actually looking rather nice out here today, but just a little windy here and there. But otherwise, we're doing okay. But we always need help. So until we can finally get out of this and by summer, hopefully, be in a place and be able to do things. But a little something was passed on to me the other night uh, through the comment section of one of the other videos. I forget which one, but I'm not sure if it was the last one or one before. But uh, John Eaves has come out and, well, consequently, removed his Facebook account, but he came out and admitted in an interview that uh, they were legally required to alter the designs from the original series. They could they could not use the Matt Jeffries designs for some strange reason, because on the surface, it's like CBS owns Star Trek, lock, stock, and phaser emitter, whole thing, especially on the TV side. And Discovery is still ostensibly a TV show, so what's up? This kind of just goes back to, you know, a lot of people saying, you know, that Midnight's Edge was full of it because they said bad robots in there and yet they're not listed anywhere in there. Well, why else would they be required to change everything? JJ's got his fingers in there somewhere. Maybe through Alex Kurtzman being involved or something or some behind the things deal where they don't get credit. But they're in there somewhere. Otherwise, they wouldn't be legally required to change a damn thing because they CBS owns the property outright. All they got to do is throw Roddenberry a, Roddenberry's estate a check, you know, every week because they're still they're based on Star Trek created by Gene Roddenberry. That gets them. That gets the, you know, the estate a check. Other than that, they shouldn't have to pay anybody a damn thing outside of you know the, the staff. The people who are actually doing the work. So yeah, it, it kind of points that yeah, bad robots in there somewhere. And the legal requirement is so that they don't. You know, I, I'm not sure. It's, you know, legal requirement as a legal barrier to keep JJ from getting his hands on the original. You know, the the actual prime timeline stuff, so that he can't take it and run with it. And it kind of goes to the thing of, you know, you can't call it prime, okay? There's no way you can honestly refer to it as prime timeline because, uh, newsflash, Alex Kurtzman, when you change the look and you change the technology and all the design, you have changed the established time, you know, timeline there. This is an, this is now a period piece now at this point in the in the franchise history. You can't just go back and make the ship completely different in design wise and aesthetic and, and then call it the same thing. No, it doesn't work that way. You damn well know it doesn't work that way because there's no way you can get away with it in any other genre. You know, you couldn't, you know, take a Nimitz class carrier back to World War II, like you know, like final countdown type of scenario, and say, Well, yeah, I had Nimitz class carriers back there. No, Nimitz classes weren't around until the seventies. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. You can't put t you know F-14s fighting the Japanese Zeros in there and not call it a change in the timeline. But still, the Navy, mm, different Navy. <laughs> the same way you can't take these colossally oversized ships and stick them back at a time when you know the biggest ship out there was the uh, first ship was the Enterprise at 947 feet, that, and that's the size of a freaking aircraft carrier by itself. Since when is that not big? This Star Destroyer NV is getting out of hand here, guys. Okay, it was, it, the Starship Enterprise is not the Battlestar Enterprise. Look at these stupidly huge ships. It's like, you know, forget. Come on. Like Gene Kuhn said, he's not looking for realistic. He's looking for plausible. And this is not plausible, okay? Now, they get ships that freaking huge, you know? And again, the timeline has been established, you know? Every other series has backed up what this what that you know period looked like. 
And then that was, they're only backed up what the original series looked like. And by derivation, you, you go back and that's what the uh, the pine, the cage era looked like. And there's no way you can look at the cage and then Discovery and say these two ships are in the same time, you know, the same fleet in the same time. And you also know damn well when the Enterprise shows up. I mean, one, the 10 year gap, we've seen what the ship looks like at both ends of that 10 year gap. We've seen what it looks like in the cage and what it looks like when no man has gone before. And there's virtually no difference. There's a few changes in a couple of markings here and, and a couple of lights. It does not increase in size by about two times and suddenly sprout slap back nacelles and sparkly, you know, you know, you know, swept back, you know, struts and sparkly, you know, bussards. We're still talking the red, you know, red domes and the, and the spikes and the same damn model. You know. So you don't get that pass. Sorry, Johnny's tried that one in the interview. Well, there's another 10 new gaps. We can get it. We can probably get away with it. No, we don't. Because like I said, with the cage in the mix there, you're not doing a prequel to the original series. You're in the middle of it. Because with, with the way it is now, original series starts with the cage. And then you got like a third, you know, that's called a 12 year gap there between the events of the cage and where no man has gone before. 11, 12 year gap there. And so you're getting right in there, and it's like the cage has already happened. It is established what the uniforms look like, what the ship looks like, what the technology pretty much looks like here. And you may not like paper printouts in this day and age, but guess what? They're still useful. You know? One thing, a paper printout doesn't short out on you. You, know? you can hold it in your hands and say, hey, I have it right here. You know? Don't have to call it up on a computer screen or whatever. It's just right there. And also holograms. Certainly of that complexity. Well, it's a, it's a double-edged thing because you have to, you know, holograms that the technology wasn't even that high at next gen era DS9. But they also looked a hell of a lot better at DS9. You... They may be able to move around all over the room, but they also look like video monitor shit, okay? It's like, we're not talking Star Trek. We're talking Star Wars holograms. That is what they're playing with. And there's, it's the more of, Star, of JJ's Star Wars envy. We're trying to make Star Trek into Star Wars, it doesn't work that way. It's like if you're gonna, you know, go back and make, you know, remake Gunsmoke, and let's make it more like Lord of the Rings. I mean, let's give you know, Marshall Dillon a sword. Make Fester a wizard. That'll be fun. And still trying, but it's still the same timeline as, as, as Gunsmoke. Yeah. Make Miss Kitty an escape slave. You know, make, you know, have her played by Beyonce, and it, but it's still Miss Kitty. No, it isn't. There's a compelling story there, but it ain't Miss Kitty, you know? And that ain't you know, that ain't Gunsmoke, that ain't Dodd City you're showing us there. I know some people say, well, you can't do it. Well, you know, it's the thing. The fact that you can't do it shows that you shouldn't do it. And it doesn't work with the Westerns. It wouldn't. It doesn't work in any other genre either. Sci you, know, you can't just say, so it's science fiction. No. Science fiction does not mean no rules. And I'll comment to Les Moonves. I've actually been a bit of an admirer of his for the way he turned around CBS because they weren't doing well when he came in. And he turned into you know, a juggernaut that practically owns the planet at this point. But when it comes to building and maintaining an established franchise, you're an idiot. One, uh, when someone has to explain to you the difference between Star Wars and Star Trek, maybe you shouldn't really be making decisions on that property. You know? You should maybe, you know, seek out some people who really know what they're doing. And Alex Kurtzman, I don't give a crap how much money those movies made. They don't know what they're doing on that side because they're making big, colossal mistakes and don't even realize they're making them. That's how ignorant they are of the material. They think because they're fans as a kid, they know what they're doing. No, sorry. It's not that simple. Next Generation had a lot of fans on the, uh, that came in with their scripts in hand, and not all of them made it. Because there's a there's a... There's a learning curve there of how to actually make the show. And there's more to it than just, you know, get a weird premise and put it on the Enterprise. There's a certain storytelling style and tone you got to maintain on there. And also, you got to, you know, 
and the, well, this way, well, we don't we don't eat unburdened by can I? For a show that is, you know, and, and the J.J. movie is supposed to be, you know, trying to get away from canon, they are the most canon-referencing movies and shows I've ever seen in my life. You go back and look at all the other, like, six, seven show, you know, movies and series, they really don't reference everything as much. And, and this thing, there's call-outs every five freaking minutes. As if that's supposed to try and establish it, that it's prime timeline. And well, we're 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 trying. We know it. We, no, you're not. You're just making up. You're just digging names out of a off Star Trek.com and throwing them in there. It's like okay, you know how to look up how to look up you know, memoryalpha.com. Very good. Now, do you know what the hell you're you're using when you're talking? Like it uh, it goes back to like the JJ Trek with Delta Vega, and suddenly it's you know no, it's that's Ice Planet Hoth. Okay. Delta Vega was a desert planet, okay? At least very rocky. It wasn't a snow, you know, snow blizzard thing with big monsters running around. So that just because you can look up a name doesn't mean you know what the name is and you can use it properly. Because that's a more insulting thing. It's not, you know, when you start trying to use canon and you use it wrong. And people call that out on you. And someone like Bob Orsi throws a hissy fit on TrekMovie.com. We're not, we're not good fans. No, we're just attentive fans. The fact that we're fans, so yeah, we appreciate the material, and we don't appreciate when people abuse it. This is not what we, we fought to, to bring back, you know, over and over again, okay? I remember when uh, shortly after Next Gen was announced, and you know, it was at uh, that uh, Starfest StarCon, I think they were still doing both at the same time, at the Regency Hotel, and Richard Arnold just ended the presentation showing what was coming up. With you know the next generation, the new ship and the cast and all that, Nichelle Nichols came on right after and said, you know, "I just realized after all this time, you've won. You finally won the show. You know they brought the show back to TV, and of course uproarious applause. But in retrospect, kind of wondering, uh, did we really win, or did we? You know, <laughs> it's kind of like the dog, dog who caught the car. Now what do we do?" Yeah. What are you, Jones? What is your problem? Come on. You got the food, you got the water, you got ventilation back there. What is your problem? Yeah. Cat's being cranky today. I don't know why. Yeah, they... Seriously, I mean, you got a year layoff here anyway, so, like, I really don't think any production is even close to happening right now. And if they do, it's certainly enough time to reverse course and change it. But, yeah. Right now, you want to win back the fanboys... Uh, Les, well, here's some free advice from a hardcore fanboy who's trying to turn pro on this, by the way, because I'm you know, okay, working on the concords and everything. So, yeah, it, it probably matters a little more to me because i got to keep track of this crap. And as it is right now, Discovery does not fit at all and will not go in because it's another alternate timeline just by the virtue of the fact that you've changed everything. And I really don't feel like doing a separate book just to accommodate your crap, Okay. So basically, you want to fire everybody. Start over. Write this show off as a one-off, and it's an alternate thing. If you like it, great. There's a DVD set. You know, set. But if you want to try and get a Star Trek series, it's actually going to fly. And it, again, you can get away with a lot of stuff in the movies because it's a movie. It's more or less a one-off. you got to do the big bombastic story. You know, storyline that's, you know, those have to be kind of epic. But trying to mistake Star Trek itself as an epic is a fatal flaw right there because it's not an epic. It's a setting. It's a format. You can do epics. You can also do little rom-coms. You can do mysteries. You, know, you can do any kind of story you can think of within that format. But it's not a big sprawling epic like Star Wars. And that was, that's the big fatal flaw of J.J.'s reasoning when he started off with that. Trying to make it like Star Wars. It doesn't work that way. Star Wars is, is a creature of the cinema. And that's why that works, because it's made for that thing. And it's made, it is a big, bombastic, sprawling story. You know? And you can do little stories around the side of you, because you got the, we're now going to be nine big major episodes of, of this story. And you can do little side stories on the thing, like the Clone Wars, and Rebels, and Rogue One, and Halt and Solo, and the Kenobi movie at some point. But Star Trek is not like that. 
and trying to make it like that, it doesn't work and you have problems and you start screwing up when you don't even realize you're screwing up. So yeah, you is it fire everybody, maybe keep Rod around for the sake of credibility with the fan base. So yeah, we got a Ruddenberry on board. Yeah. He doesn't nearly experience in this sort of thing as his old man did, but you know, he's there as a keeper of the flame and make sure those checks keep coming in every week. But there is a load of you know experienced Star Trek producers out there that would like to come in, I'm sure, and try and correct this mess. Even if it turns out in the opening episode, you bring in Patrick Stewart and John Delancey and they argue a bit and Q snaps his fingers and boom, everything's back to, back to where it should be. You know, it's like the opening five minutes, you know. Because sometimes the reset button is your friend. When you screw up this colossally and you're painting yourself into this big a corner. And this is not just a big corner. They're now in a box canyon and surrounded by Comanches, okay, who don't like you. So it's, it's time to just hit the button and start over. Uh, yeah. Like I said, yeah, we're subscribed to CBS All Access, but it's in spite of Discovery. We watched them all offline, you know, on other means. We didn't, I have yet to even click on a Discovery episode on CBS All Access. I watched a few original series. Jones, no. No. You don't need it up there. Likes to get on the dash. I don't know why. I think there's stuff on the dash. He just knocked things over. He did that. But, you, you know, and keeping up on the daily soap operas and some of the primetime shows. But again, we're not the target demographic. Government. They're going for the, you know, the millennials type who they couldn't give two figs about, you know, old shows. You know? Me, I'm all about old shows. <laughs> I don't know. One of these days we can get a chance to leave the computer set up and just go browsing through there start looking at a bunch of old stuff. And just go through and see some old all in the family stuff that would not fly at all today because of the language. And not even dirty words, just certain words. It's just now completely verboten. Archie Bunker, Archie Bunker would, know, would not be a cultural hero like he became. He'd be burned in effigy by these idiots. But that's getting off track here, so Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, again, this is the first time really we've had someone actually come out and openly admit they, you know, legally required to change established Star Trek designs by the company that already legally owns the property outright. So again, you know, something is going on here, and it's looking more and more like Midnight Touch is right. JJ is in there somewhere. Bad Robot has got its fingers in there. And yeah, they're legal required because they're they're under that license, so they got to change it, or you know, or basically the X in our lawsuit is you know worthless because they just ceded control of the franchise to somebody else. Yeah. So that's about it. You know, PayPal, Patreon down below, and I think I'll throw in the cafe pressure because it has been kind of lagging there lately. Try for what the cat's up to here. Catch you later.